So we've got two people missing and me vastly underprepared. I think you're going to have to um, really bring this together. <laughs> no pressure. Oh boy. <laughs> All right, this is going to be fun. Yeah. I actually, I actually wanted to start about asking uh, how your phone experiment's going. All right, yeah, I'm pretty good. So I like to do little experiments every now and then. You know, not necessarily technology, but tech or food or just anything in my life. And then two weeks ago, I I think I was listening to a podcast. It was specifically a parenting podcast, and it mm-hmm. talked about. Um, like how our kids will pick up our habits, like our screen habits from us. Right. And and there's something else I can't remember what it was, but both things triggered me to start thinking about how much I was using my phone. And then I thought, hey, oh, that was the other thing I remember now. It's Have you seen the Light Phone or Light Phone 2? It's like this little e-ink phone and pretty much all it does is make phone calls. I'm not sure you can even send messages. Um, the, the Light Phone 2 can send messages. And get, like, basic directions. The original one could only make phone calls. Um, it's an interesting concept to me, but the thought of paying $600 for for that seems a little ridiculous. You can get, like, a flip phone for, like, $15. Yeah, exactly. Well, actually, what it um, led me down the track of thinking was my Apple Watch LTE is pretty much the light phone, except it's on my wrist, so it's even better. And yeah. it's got the same phone number, which the light phone kind of says it does i think maybe depending on what country you're in so i don't know just try using my apple watch for a week as my like primary or primary on the go device i wouldn't say primary communications device because i'm still using my macbook mostly at home so yeah week one went by with very very few problems so (laughs) and my phone it just stayed face down in a cupboard from monday until it ran out of battery on friday night i woke up on saturday and that was the first i'd noticed that my watch wasn't connected to it anymore um Hmm. yeah so charged it up and then kind of haven't really gone back to it yet have you had any battery issues relying on the watch primarily I've only had one day where it ran out really early and I was a little stuck. And I think it was a bug. What I did was I used turn-by-turn directions on my watch, which is a pretty rare example. And at the end of that, I checked. It was only about 30 minutes of turn-by-turn. I thought, let's see what effect that had on the battery. And it was at 40%. This is by 4 p.m., so that's pretty good by 4 p.m. But then about half an hour later, it was completely dead. So my feeling is that... The GPS got stuck on or there was some bug there and it just ate the battery up after the turn by turn was switched on or switched off. Uh, Yeah, that'd be my guess. I can't think of any other reason the battery would drain that quickly. Yeah, it was just really fast and strange. Huh. So So I I take it you don't make a lot of phone calls a day then or anything? I actually make tons of phone calls a day. (laughs) but Really? um, Yeah, but not from my watch most of the time. Ah, right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so I think the battery life for the watch is like one hour of phone phone talking. So, mm, yeah. Is that from the speaker or from the AirPods or what? Um, I'm not sure uh, if they clarify. Mm, okay. I assume I assume they're just saying from the speaker itself and not with the added drain of Bluetooth being on as well. Mm, I would have said that Bluetooth actually used less energy than the speaker, though. Oh, really? Yeah. You think that pushing the speaker would take more energy than wireless yeah, signal? I think so. Yeah. Like if I know if you're listening to music from your iPhone speaker, it drains it way quicker than just putting it through AirPods. Oh, really? Yeah. I can't say I've ever tried playing music through my speaker for too long, so I wouldn't <laughs> have much experience yeah. with that. No, me either, but there are people that do. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, on the Metro, people like blasting their music from their cheap phone speakers. Really? On the Metro? Oh, oh yeah, everywhere. People just... It's it's like the modern boombox. People just walk around playing music or watching <laughs> YouTube videos or whatever they're doing. Yeah. Just wait till someone um, brings like a little power brick and then plugs their HomePod into it and puts the HomePod on the shoulder. <laughs> I mean, at least it would sound nice then. Yeah, at least so. <laughs> uh, um, the other, other thing I really liked about... Oh, the tweet that you actually saw, I think, was about... Uh, what was it called? Uh, Outcast on the Apple Watch, listening to podcasts. That is such yeah. a good app if you need some podcasts on the go because you can actually browse the podcast directory, search oh, really? and download, and even do that on LTE. It's so good. Wow. I'll have to check that out. Yeah. And I'm mostly spooking it because it's made by an Australian guy. So, there you go. 
<laughs> no, it's a really good app. <laughs> nice. So I, I got a quick question. Is Perth like a big city? Is it a big area? Uh, I think we've got about 2 million people, so it's pretty big. Oh, wow. Okay. It just seems like uh, whenever I hear someone talking about being in Australia, they're either in Sydney or they're in Perth. And I'd never heard of Perth until we started this podcast. Now I feel like it's everywhere. Oh, really? Oh, cool. Yeah. Maybe we're getting famous. <laughs> or yeah, maybe it's maybe. just a confirmation <laughs> bias thing. Is that what it's called when you like you see you buy one car and then you see that car everywhere? Yeah, yeah. Actually, I had a headlight go out, and then ever, ever since then, it seems like every other car I pass on the road also has their headlights out. So, <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Um, but Perth, so yeah, we've got uh, the east coast, which everyone knows Sydney's over on, or they don't know where it is, but it's on the east coast. Right, it's the biggest city over there, and then pretty much once you're past, like if you're Cut Australia in two. There's really nothing over on the west coast except for Perth. That's why it's ah, okay. either Perth or Sydney, I would say. <laughs> and it, it's one of the most isolated cities in the world. I don't think it's the most isolated because you've got like Hawaii, but um, right. you have to drive pro- more than two days to get to the next capital city. Wow. Maybe like three or four, three days maybe to get to Adelaide, which is the next one, which is also where that podcast app for the watch comes from, Adelaide. Nice little city there. Um, I actually, actually didn't realize that uh, Australia was was that wide that it would take multiple days to travel across. Oh yeah, yeah. There's a famous stretch of road called the Nullarbor, um, Null Arbor, Latin I think for no trees, and we've got the longest piece of straight road in the world. I think I think it's ninety miles straight. Wow, uh, wow. Yeah. yeah, it's a boring drive. I've done it once in each direction. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, I can't. I can kind of relate. Uh, I live right right in the middle of the U.S., um, and everything around me is flat farmland. So, so to to go to a big city, uh, the biggest city that's near me is a couple hours to the east. But if you want to head west towards like Colorado, um, you've got a good eight hours of driving through completely flat land with maybe some cows every once in a while. Really, eight hours. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I know that's nothing compared to a few days, but... Oh, yeah, but still, your population is vastly bigger than ours. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's just mostly farmland out here, so there's not much to to see. All right. Are you a fan of right-to-repair bills in California, though, that require smartphone manufacturers to offer repair info and parts? (laughs) Wow, smooth transition. (laughs) Thanks. Um... So I've I've tinkered around with with phone repairs in the past. Um, things like the iPhone four were a nightmare to repair. Maybe it was the four S. Yeah. Like most iPhones, you just take the screen off and then you can get to the parts underneath. Whereas I think it was the four S. You actually had to take the back off and then take every single component out before you could take the screen off if you wanted to do a screen replacement. Uh, so. But as far as, as requiring manufacturers to include repair manuals, I don't know. I feel like it could be asking for trouble. It might encourage people who would otherwise not, not try to, to open up their phone and damage it more. Yeah, there are so many cowboy repair shops out there. Like, there are so many dodgy repairs that I've seen in the past. You know, people, especially since um, a Touch ID was introduced, so many non-working Touch ID sensors. and yeah phones that are no longer waterproof and all this because all these little kiosks mostly i see in shopping malls um yeah yeah exactly 80 dollars screen repairs but you don't get your phone back with like a decent screen it looks terrible and then you have all these follow-on issues and to top it off you don't have a warranty from apple anymore yeah so looking at the the top comments on this post here um top comment actually says this doesn't mean a whole lot you can legally fo- force phone manufacturers to provide non-proprietary information, but you can't force them to actually make the devices repairable. <laughs> so so they'll say, like, yeah, this is how you can fix it, but we also glued everything together, so there's <laughs> nothing you can do. Yeah, so um, to, to actually read the Act, um, to follow on from that, it says, The Right to Repair Act will provide consumers with the freedom to have their electronic products and appliances fixed by a repair shop or service provider of their choice. Uh, a practice, uh, blah, blah, blah. So it sounds, yeah, not like they are being pushed to make the device repairable like they said, but that you have to, uh, um, 
the option of having it repaired by someone else is needs to be there and there needs to be support for it and it doesn't um, like affect ongoing warranty repairs and things like that. Right. This, this uh, problem has been addressed in the past when it comes to automotive manufacturing. Um, you know, like automotive manufacturers can't be required to force you to come to a dealership to have your car, you know, the tires changed or, or the oil changed or whatever repairs need to be done. Um, there's usually a, a shop manual published with each car that that can walk any, you know, qualified mechanic through doing repairs. Um, and I think I think that's probably fine. I think we should should be on board with letting qualified people who know what they're doing make repairs on devices we own. Yeah, maybe some sort of um, standards program needs to be set up then to guarantee that the person working on it is actually qualified and it's not someone who watched a couple of videos on YouTube and then bought like a pentalobe screwdriver and decided that they yeah. can't do this. That that would be an interesting thing to partner with this bill is like some kind of certification like a mechanic would get that, you know, you can say your shop is certified for phone repairs. And although this is starting to sound like the, you can already get certified uh, Apple repair status, or at least you used to be able to, I'm not sure if Apple still offers that or not. And you could take your phone to a certified Apple refurbisher or whatever, and that wouldn't void your warranty using them. Yeah, they definitely exist still. Yeah. So. Yeah. What's that called? Apple so, Authorized Repair Centers, maybe? Yeah. Authorized Repair Centers. So I guess I'm not sure how this would differentiate from those that already exist. Unless we're just saying anyone can open their phone now and that will void the warranty, which I think you're going to run into some legal trouble with that. Mm, yeah. So. Well, neither of us have to worry not being in California, huh? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so, California is is one of those states that really push high. Man, I'm not going to know how to describe this. They make a lot more laws than every other state in the U.S. <laughs> really? Like, we have, we, have, we have fish that you can buy as pets that glow in the dark that they're illegal in California. Oh, no. Yeah, because because te- technically they're genetically modified to glow in the dark. <laughs> and you're not allowed to own genetically modified pets in California. So um, they, they really push hard to legislate everything, and I think this could just be a result of that, and it's not going to have much of an impact. I think that's the strangest thing I've heard all week. Congratulations. <laughs> I'm glad I could do that for you. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, I wonder if you can get some of these fish in Australia. That sounds really good. They're they're called glow fish. Just G L O fish. I'm not sure if they're available everywhere. I mean like they sell them in like Walmarts here, so mm, okay. Oh there's actually a whole website, shopglowfish.com. So you gotta have like a special tank with like a black light in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they're pretty cool. They're just like standard species of fish that have all been genetically modified. So I don't know. I don't know how into fish you are, but you can get like barbs or tetras, or what else do they have here? Uh, I have to admit, I'm not really into fish. Yeah, there's 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 a few different types here you could get, and they've just been. I don't know if they've been injected with something to make them glow, or if they've been. I feel like it has to be an injection. I don't think you could breed them to glow in the dark necessarily. But, yeah, it sounds tricky. Yeah. Anyway. Kind of Maybe they just off. make them eat a lot of, um, like, crushed up glowing things. Oh, it says down here they're born to shine, so so I guess that does mean they're... Well, I don't know if that's a, a, a joke or if they're... I don't know. It sounds like a I'm joke. Shining and reading, glowing are very different things. Yeah. Reading into this too much. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. I think that's that's good. Let's push on to... A uh, post by a user called Omikun, Omikun, okay. Omikun maybe if they're Japanese, who wrote a script that doubles his battery life. So he's talking about on his Mac, not on an iOS device. Right. Um, and it's specifically, originally it was specifically for um, Unity on his Mac, 
and but it does work for other things. And what he's done is make a little app, originally a script, but now an app that um, kind of forces apps to force nap. So, uh, sorry, app nap. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think app nap's the feature. So this was a feature that was introduced quite a few years ago. Um, basically, when apps go into the background, they can support a state called app nap. So things that don't need to run any background tasks would normally need this. Um, most of, well, some of Apple apps, Apple's apps support AppNap. Right. And it's really good for the battery because, um, you know, Apple laptops seem to get better battery life than anything else. And part of that is because of AppNap. But a lot of third-party apps don't support it. And that's probably because a lot of them are doing background tasks. Um, but this will actually force them to use it. So as soon as you, if you added an app to the Force Nap app, which is what this guy made, and then you alt tab into something else, that app you just tabbed away from will now be in a napped or sleeping state. I have actually tried this myself. Oh yeah, but um, yeah, apparently it doubles his battery life in the case where Unity was destroying his battery life. Did you get a chance to try it? Uh, no, actually, I read about this a couple weeks ago. Um, I'm surprised this post is still up on the top front page. It must be really popular. Um, uh, well, actually, I just sort by top of the last month and then pick anything from the last two uh, weeks. Okay. So, <laughs> so this is this is actually right on the brink because it's 14 days old. So just cut it. Gotcha. Well, looking at the uh, the post again, I haven't seen it since he made the first post. It seems like he got some some pretty uh, uh, positive feedback from all this. Um, I have I haven't tried it tried it either. Um, it seems like there's kind of a trade off here. Um, the the battery life is, is huge for one, but you're trading off the ability for apps to do anything if you don't have them the primary focus of your operating system. So I'm not sure if this extends to something like I'm trying to think of a practical application here. But like if you're trying to render a video and you opened a YouTube page, <laughs> that video rendering program would potentially just be frozen or put to sleep instead of continuing what it's doing in the background. Um, I think for general use cases, that makes a lot of sense for like casual users, probably aren't trying to do a whole bunch of stuff in the background while also using their computer, um, and maybe should even be a feature that Apple considers implementing in the future. Uh, but no, I, have, I haven't actually tried it out. I don't usually take my Mac with me anywhere. It sits on my desk. And I use an iPad on the go, so I haven't had a need to try to preserve my battery life. Mm, yeah, okay. Just looking through some of Apple's apps. So Safari doesn't support AppNap, although I know it does have some um, power-saving features in there, like um, Sleeping Flash or whatever, if you actually have that enabled. Yeah. Photos doesn't have AppNap, which is weird, like surely Photos would. Messages I think does. Photos would try iTunes to... iTunes like, does. Okay. Sorry. I was going to say, I think Photos would probably want to run in the background in the case that it's trying to stay in sync with iCloud. So while it's running in the background, if you take a photo on your iPhone, it'll sync to your computer. And it wouldn't do that if it was sleeping. Yeah, the question is, does the um, does the AppNap extend to like all the sub-processes, or the, the system processes that an app uses? Um, like, Photos itself isn't doing the, the sync of Photos. It would be like Photos Cloud Daemon or whatever. Yeah, it's doing it. Um, um, yeah, I'm not sure how far AppNav would extend like, into the services that all the apps use. Right. Or they could just run into some kind of, I don't know, edge case error if if a background process was trying to download photos, but the program itself was not responding because it was asleep. I don't know. Mm. Photos are so bad for battery, just while we're on that, because I mean, it'll pretty much do anything it wants to even when you're not plugged into power like it'll be yeah generating jpeg previews for raw files it'll be not so much uploading but it'll be um like converting um hevc files to mobs and it'll be doing all sorts of crazy uh, stuff yeah sorting people by their faces and creating memories and yeah It's some really, really neat features, but yeah, it definitely takes a lot of processing and battery power to get it all done. Yeah, it takes a lot, especially um, in the last two weeks since I haven't been using my phone. I Well, the first thing I missed was taking photos, so I borrowed a camera. It happened to be a DSLR, and so I'm taking photos in RAW, and um, yeah, photos will spin up the fan in the MacBook really quick as soon as you <laughs> start importing RAW files, and it's generating previews, looking I for bet. faces, all the memories. Yeah. <laughs> geotagging things yeah so, are intense. you uh 
pretty active photographer? Like, would you take uh, a handful of photos a day, or just every once in a while, or? Yeah, I would take at least a couple of photos a day. Yeah, so yeah. Ever just, since I was like, um, like really young, I think like ten or so, um, picked up my dad's like 1970s slr and oh, yeah. was pretty much hooked from then and actually it wasn't until i got an iphone that i stopped messing around with cameras which is really funny that now i've put the iphone away i've gone straight back to using cameras every day huh so i was i was very similar but it was more uh videography was my interest oh yeah so i'd i'd basically film everything i did and as as a kid, I would turn my life into like a talk show and I'd tell the camera <laughs> what I'm about to do and then I'd film myself doing it and that'd be basically every day of my life. Oh, I imagine if YouTube existed back then. Um this could been... all be there. <laughs> well how old was I? I was just starting middle school when YouTube became a thing. Two thousand six, mm-hmm. is that right? Yeah, so I'd have been in the sixth grade. Um so I, me and my friends definitely post a lot of videos to YouTube and I've uh-huh. over the years started a channel for basically every genre there, there is. <laughs> so between short skits or let's play channels or like product unboxing channels or things like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I actually had for a while, um, if I was stuck on it, right when the boom of like product unboxing videos happened like around 2009 i started a channel and for a while i had like a ribbon on my youtube channel that was fastest growing tech channel on youtube really wow yeah back when youtube put ribbons on channels this was an old layout but yeah i have to admit i don't actually remember that at all yeah um man it was back back when you could customize your channel and like have you could choose the color of your background layer and then the color of the text on everything and it kind of felt like myspace (laughs) <laughs> so facebook but, let you do that for a while too but no i don't think i ever used youtube that, that not that well but like you did like i never uploaded anything i was never a creator back in the day really? so i've got no memory of all that well um, creators so, generous for what i was doing <laughs> <laughs> so is it why aren't you doing it now that you've got an iphone 10 which is you know possibly one of the better cameras you've owned why, why am I not making YouTube videos? Yeah. Um, well, Unboxing well, videos. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I actually did for a while. Um, the, actually, the last the last product I did an unboxing video on was my iPhone 10. Oh, All right. Okay. I actually, like, it was like five or six years later, just, just for fun, I was, like, looking through all of my old YouTube channels, and I found my tech channel. And I was like, what if I started posting videos on that again? Mm-hmm. And I started that up. It wasn't for very long. I got bored with it pretty quickly. I think the first new video I uploaded was the second generation iPad Pro unboxing. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I ended on the iPhone 10. So what is that? Like six months? Yep. Not even. Uh, but it was a good time. I actually, in the meantime, have become a pretty big like vintage computer collector. And I was really hoping to transition the channel into talking about all the vintage electronics I collect, but I just don't have time. It's a pretty big commitment if I want to make good quality videos. So Yeah, that's the thing. There are just so many people out there just making, you know, just hitting record on their phone and then uploading it, but to actually stand out, you need to put quite a bit of time into it. Yeah. Yeah, especially for the things I'd want to want to talk about. So these old electronics, I need to research components and the history of these companies and I just don't have time for it right now. It's something I'd like to do in the future. So I've got I've got some things in my collection. Like I've got this toy computer from the '90s that actually has it has an entire Apple II in it, and it's a, a prototype computer that never actually got released. Wow. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, did it have a name? It's called the Tiger Learning Computer. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was it was a partnership between Tiger Electronics and Apple. Um, and Steve Jobs killed it off when he came back. So there's only a few of oh, these yeah. that, that ever that ever actually made it out to the public it was like in a test market kind of phase um but yeah i per like they're pretty rare i purchased mine with like the original box and everything for a little over three thousand dollars so wow yeah you, yeah you definitely need to start making some videos about this 
Yeah, like that's that's one of the main ones. Is like it's so rare that almost no one's ever seen these things before. So it's just kind of cool to show off this kind of niche technology, especially relating to Apple. I'd be keen to say that. Does your channel have a name? You could just spruik it now. Oh boy. <laughs> so when I started the channel, it was called I Technology Today. Yeah. Um, I tried to do a rebrand rebrand when I uh, restarted making videos. And I called it Tech Today, but I don't think that that's actually going to sh- come up with anything. I'm trying to figure out how to get to it now. Oh, YouTube doesn't work. Let's see. Are you itechnologytoday.blogspot.com.eu? Oh my god. <laughs> you uh, are? That, that blog uh, accompanied the original iteration of the YouTube channel. Oh, good. Last so post, the, iPhone the, 4.0 beta. April yeah, there used 13, to be 2010. posts associated with uh, each video. We'd have an accompanying blog post with like more information. So actually, if you're on the on the blog spot, you might be able to find... Actually, if you search iTimeWatch Today on Google, one of my very old videos shows up as a search result here. An iPod Touch 3G unboxing. <laughs> You've got some iPod Nano test footage, test vi- oh, video yeah. test. When the, when the iPod Nano got a video camera on it temporarily, yeah. So this channel was never, I mean, it got that fi- fast growing moniker for a while, uh, which just had to do with how quickly it got its 200 subscribers, but then it never grew any faster. <laughs> so it was uh, like 200. really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, man, there's some like embarrassing stuff on here. <laughs> Good. 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 <laughs> That's what everyone needs. Yeah. <laughs> so, but were, you, were you able to find the channel here? Oh, actually, I found it. It's youtube.com right. forward slash user forward slash iTechnology today. We'll bring you straight to the channel. Uh, I think I, I think I've got it here. Oh, yeah. iPhone 10 unboxing. SNES Classic unboxing. <laughs> yeah. For a while, I'm just like, I'll just turn the camera on every time I buy something. Is basically my idea behind it. Yeah, yeah, cool. I did that but, for a little bit uh, last yeah. year as well, but not before that. I think I did a, um, a SNES classic unboxing as well. Oh, really? Yeah. I would very little effort into it. I didn't even talk. I just unboxed it in front of the phone and then uploaded that to YouTube. <laughs> That's probably probably better than me adding my two cents over the top of the unboxing. <laughs> <on the website. laughs> so, like, man, if you click into one of these videos, though, uh, I do, like, a short introduction. You can kind of see some of my collection behind me in the introduction stuff. And that's oh, yeah? the stuff okay. I, I, I really wanted to get into talking about, but never never transitioned to fully. So. Uh, if you scroll down through your videos, you can see you through the ages. Yeah. <laughs> At, so, like, I think the oldest one's, like, around 2009, which would have been, like, right when I was starting high school. Yeah, if I scroll to the bottom, iPod Touch 3G unboxing eight years ago, 37K views. Not too bad. Yeah, I think the best one, like the iPod Touch 3G review, is got 65k, and I think that's probably the best video on the channel. <laughs> yeah, yep, sure is. So it was it was fun for a while, but it's interesting to me and kind of disappointing looking back now. Techno or tech review channels like MKBHD or what uh, Ty's iPhone Help or things like that were starting at the exact same time I was. And I was actually growing faster than them during that time. So if I would have, like, stuck with it, I could potentially be, a, you know, a channel that size. Yeah, it's sticking with it. That's why it's hard. underappreciated hardest part of making videos for YouTube is that even when you've lost interest, if you want to make it, you need to keep putting out videos every couple of days, every week. If yeah, especially really as a... Uh, for years. Yeah. Especially as a high school kid who, like... Man, getting the new iPod Touch was like a big purchase for me, and like that's the only thing I could make a video on. Hmm. So, at least with tech, it's a lot easier than with some other products. Say, for instance, cars, because you've got your car you can review, and maybe like your partner yeah. might have a car, and someone in your family might have a different car, it might be a piece of junk, but you can review that. But to actually get uh, like a really good car to review, it's almost impossible. Whereas it's only. You know, $1,000 for the best phone. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Actually, if you scroll up, we'll scroll down, I guess. There's a video from like eight years ago where I talk about the announcement of the iPad 
and you can see just how wrong I was about how how terrible the iPad was going to be. Oh, did you talk about how bad it was? Yeah, I think I have a quote in this in this video that I thought was pretty clever at the time. I said, Apple's lack of creativity in a name really reflects their lack of creativity in a device. <laughs> uh, but yeah, basically I said it was going to flop. And now it's basically the only tablet that's still profitable. <laughs> yep. So, <laughs> well, a lot of people still say it's a flop and it is, yeah, basically the only tablet that's around. Yeah. So, same with the watch. It's pretty much the only smartwatch that's doing anything. Yeah, did you see uh Google's rebranding Android Wear? Yeah, Wear OS. Yeah. I don't know if that means they're going to actually push an update out for it now because it's been a couple years. I think it's just that, part of their process to sunset Android as a brand, really. Oh, you think they're going to sunset Android? Uh, as a brand, yeah. Not as an operating system, of course, but ah. everything is, you know, if you go to the um, Pixel homepage, for instance, there's like one or two mentions on, of Android on the entire page. Huh. Yeah. I wouldn't be really surprised if it became Google OS or maybe something yeah. slightly more imaginative than that. Although Android is such a massive brand and it is, it would be hard to do something like that because, you know, Samsung doesn't necessarily want something Google branded on their phone. They want something a little more um, More neutral, independent. What do you say? Yeah. Like neutral or independent. Yeah. Neutral. Yeah. 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 Like Android, which doesn't have any brand connotations for the non-tech masses. Although, you know, everyone in tech knows it's basically Google. Although, although if you told me a few years ago that Apple was going to stop having iDevices and start putting Apple before the name of all their products, I wouldn't have believed that either. <laughs> so, why we don't so, have yeah. an iWatch and an iPencil, I don't know. Or iMusic anymore. <laughs> or... Uh, I'm really glad. It's like, what was the last thing they named i something? I think the iPad was the last product. iPad? Did iCloud come after iPad? Oh, you're right. You're right. iCloud did come out. Because it was rebrand mobile me. Mm, yeah. But, oh, man. I've hated the name iCloud since the day it was announced. It's so bad. Really? Yeah. Sounds terrible. <laughs> I don't know. It's just an easy way to identify products as belonging to Apple. I thought it was clever. Yeah, but so. it has... When, when did it start? 99? Or uh, around 98 time? So. with the launch of the iMac. Okay. So they've been doing it for 20 years. So this is... So it was Steve Jobs was stuck between either iMac or Mac Man, and I think they probably oh, well, went, with, he, he, went with the right choice. <laughs> he definitely made the right choice. Actually, you know, what? I think what's made it cringy is that every second, every second, every you know tenth tech channel or YouTube channel or whatever has just adopted the I in front of their name. So there's wow. been Thanks. fifteen years worth. <laughs> <laughs> So there's been, um, yeah, 15 years worth of people doing that. I'm not saying your channel's bad, but there are a lot of bad channels. <laughs> no, my channel is bad. It's got 200 oh, okay. <laughs> subscribers after like nine years. Yeah. I think it's just, it reached critical mass and yeah. it uh, jumped the shark. It was cool. It was cool. I'm telling you. But um, I don't <laughs> think it is anymore. I guess Apple knew when to jump ship and try to rebrand. So, mm, yeah, but I miss it. It's nostalgia, I think. It is very nostalgic, yeah. So, we're kind of going way off the rails on these posts here. Yeah, we're, we're out in like, the weeds. I don't think we've really got time. <laughs> Should we jump just to the next most interesting topic, which is that we've got a, an Apple event on March 27th? Yeah, this is kind of came out of the blue. Um, they're actually holding it at a high school in Chicago, which is really odd for them. Um Actually, the last the last product release Apple did in Chicago was the Newton. Wow. Okay, that's that's interesting. Yeah. So hopefully it goes better than that. <laughs> <laughs> what are you uh, actually expecting? I'm not expecting a whole lot, especially since we're going to be so close to WWDC. Um, it's definitely going to be education focused. Um, a lot of people are saying because of the style of the invite, they're expecting like a new Apple Pencil. Because it kind of looks like a hand-drawn logo, yeah, which I'd totally be on board, nice. on board for. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe one that has an eraser. We could flip it over and use the back to erase. Mm-hmm. That's probably the biggest feature that I'd, I'd want. Otherwise, the Apple Pencil is already great. Um, there's also been some rumors of 
like lower price iPad coming out, like in the two fifty to three hundred dollar price range, to appeal to the education market, and also rumors that Apple's going to drop the MacBook Air and introduce like a seven to eight hundred dollar MacBook to replace it. Yeah, that last thing you said about the MacBooks is kind of what I'm expecting. I'm not really sure about the iPads. Um, maybe a refresh on the iPad Mini, but oh, the yeah. other iPads. Um, you know, they're already pretty cheap. That Like the iPad 2017, as they call it, that's so cheap already. And it's not that old. Yeah. Uh, it's already got just last year's processor in it, I think. Um, but the current MacBook lineup is something that needs some attention because the MacBook Air has been there for so long. It's got a pretty ugly screen. Um, well, it's been, it had an update last year, didn't it? But it's more or less just been on life support for a few years. Yeah. And well, I think really the update been, last year was just them basically dropping the 11-inch model. I don't know if they did much else besides that. Like maybe a small spec bump. Yeah. Yep, I think it was just a processor generation bump and dropping the 11-inch, which I think was a little um, a helping hand to the sales of the 12-inch MacBook. Actually, if they were to uh, announce a new Mac Mini, that's what I would want to see. Are there many Mac Minis in schools? You know, there aren't really much apple computers at all in schools uh chromebooks have really taken over that marketplace at least in the u.s for a while ipads were everywhere but then chromebooks were so cheap that schools started getting those instead so this might be apple trying to regain their footing in that market but it's been so long since they've updated the mac mini and usually when you're talking about education products they're talking about like low price to appeal to that market so that's what I'd want to see, at least. Mm. What if the MacBook Air became education only, which they've done in the past? You know, you've had like the eMac um, around oh, the time yeah. of the first iMacs. And then so the consumer focused laptop line was only 12 inch MacBook and MacBook Pro, which makes sense. And then MacBook Air is only education uh, available to education and maybe at a lower price as well. Yeah, they'd have to drop the price if they did that. But I could I could see that potentially working if they're really trying to compete with Chromebooks. Um, They've been pushing really hard in the past that, you know, iPads are the devices to use in schools. And they've got a really nice, like, classroom mode for iOS that lets you have, like, multi-user support on iPads that I really wish they'd bring just to the iOS in general. But uh, that multi-user support is kind of a big deal for classrooms. Yeah, I don't know a whole lot about all the... um classroom features <laughs> not you know being too old to ever have had an ipad in school uh yeah <laughs> i mean i never have a laptop in school <laughs> i never had one either but yeah a little bit i know is from just what i catch at the keynotes mm. um, um so class kits what they use in the schools yeah or and the classwork app so i wouldn't be too surprised to see updates to those having just learned about them <laughs> <laughs> No, that was actually a comment from someone I read. It was SanDisk Player 34 says well, what he's expecting is a new iPad, Classwork app, ClassKit, and maybe in italics, a new iPhone SE. Oh, yeah, the SE. I'm waiting for the iPhone SEX. <laughs> <laughs> maybe they'll do another uh, color refresh, like they added red to the iPhone 7 last year. Maybe they'll add the gold option to the iPhone 10. Right, yeah, because it's only black and white. Yeah, and there were rumors when the iPhone X was yet to be announced that it was going to come in a blush gold color, kind of like the iPhone 8. Yeah, um, curious they didn't follow that normal scheme of silver, black, and gold. Yeah, I heard it was potentially just because they couldn't keep up with production on three devices, so they like doubled down on those two most popular colors, but I'm not sure. Yeah, supplies were a little constrained at launch, weren't they? Although not as much as everyone expected. Yeah, it was actually pretty reasonable compared to, I think, even the iPhone 7 the year before. Mm. So, But I'm surprised we... I don't know, if there's going to be a big product launch, I feel like we would have seen some leaks by now. Yeah, exactly. So this... I mean, the fact that they're holding it at a high school um, makes me feel like it's probably not going to be too big of an event and people are probably getting too excited about it. Yeah, yeah. Just the fact that they're holding an event is enough to get people excited. Do you think yeah. they will even live stream this one? Oh, I don't know. I, I assumed they would, but I mean, the high school probably doesn't have the necessary technology in place to do it. And I don't know if they're going to try to haul all that equipment with them. I mean, this is more than halfway across the country for Apple. So I don't know if they'd bother trying to set up live stream equipment there or if this really will just be kind of a private event they film and post later. Mm, yeah. So. 
So in summary, I think we've decided that they're going to release a new cheap iPad and that's about it. I wouldn't I wouldn't expect much more than that. Mm. Oh, besides the software updates as well. Yeah. I've also heard that potentially if they are releasing a new Apple Pencil, that it will have support for this cheap iPad. So Ah, uh, yeah, 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 okay. So cheap iPad, cheaper Apple Pencil for the iPad and software updates. Yeah, that's about what I'd expect. All right. So. Um, we have two other topics. Do you want to talk about um, Fortnite Battle Royale on iOS? I uh, downloaded it, but I don't have an invite to play it. So, Oh, I'll send you one. I have an invite. Oh, you legend. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I signed up for the, like, about a week ago, like, the early release thing, and I got an invite the other mm-hmm. day. Uh, and I got a couple friend invites now, so I'll definitely shoot one your way. Uh, thanks. Um, I've never played Fortnite before. <laughs> So I was yep. kind of lost. Um, the biggest disappointment right now is that, at least while it's in beta, it doesn't have MFI controller support. Oh, so really? That's you have to use the on-stream controls. And your phone gets really hot really fast, and also it drains the battery faster than any program I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> it's really nice that we're getting this. I'm not sure if you call this a AAA title, but it's a really big title coming to iPhone. Yeah, yeah, I'm surprised. Uh, I was surprised to hear how quickly it was coming to mobile. Um, yeah, like again, I this is my first experience at all in Fortnite, so I don't, I don't know much about the game or anything. Um, I know that it's a two gigabyte download, so it's pretty big. Well, it's about eighteen gig on desktop. Oh, really? Yeah, which is I was that actually big for a game looking, these days. looking at the desktop pricing because I had to go to the Fortnite like website to get my code mm-hmm. and. What kind of pricing tier is this? That it, the game costs anywhere from free to one hundred and fifty dollars, and the only difference is like the characters you get to play as. Wow! Really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All I've done is play the free one. <laughs> I haven't even looked at the prices. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it has a limited edition. It's one hundred and fifty US dollars, and it has exclusive weapon, uh, eight new heroes, uh, a four weapon pack with a new trap, uh, an exclusive pistol, and Oh, and you get two digital additions to give to friends. Ah, cool. So there must be another playing mode besides Battle Royale, is what I'm guessing. Uh, Yeah, actually, I do know a little bit about this. Fortnite started as a zombie siege game, where you'd Hmm. you'd be trying to build up your fort and protect yourself from, like, yes, zombies coming. Kind of like the original Minecraft was just zombie protection, (laughs) whatever. But when Player Unknown's Battleground started gaining traction they kind of pivoted and turned it into this big battle royale style game using their existing framework. Mm -hmm. So that's why you can build in this game is because you're originally supposed to be building forts to protect from zombies and stuff. And I think you Mm. can unlock the original game mode if you buy one of the more expensive editions of the game. Okay. Yeah. So, well, I'm pretty keen to try it out now. I've been playing a little bit on, uh, I just I boot camped my MacBook. You know, I downloaded it because there is a Mac version of it as well. Yeah. Um, it is, uh, I don't know, if I double click on the icon to start it, my Mac is literally crashes to like a black screen. It's switched off. Like, it's completely oh, really? dead. There's, there's no kernel panic. There's no crash screen. There's no like, <laughs> reboot. As soon as I double click on Fortnite, it is just like my computer sl- jumped for 10 minutes and it switched off. <laughs> Oh wow! Yeah, well, it's intense. The mobile version is definitely better optimized than that. At least I've actually been surprised how <laughs> sm- smoothly the game has been running. <laughs> so yeah. Um, yeah, I'm trying to figure out where my friend codes are here so I can can send one to you. But yeah, I'll no look into rush. it more and I'll shoot one your way at some point. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Nice. So, is there anything else here? Um, I guess just this topic that two out of three Apple devices ever sold are still in use. That doesn't surprise me at all. Apple mm. has has so much better support for their legacy products than any other company. Like the fact that like what the iPhone 5S can still run iOS 11, which came out five years ago. So yeah, that's right. Yep, they've been pretty good it's about still... supporting older devices. That's hard to believe that two out of three though. It's really hard to believe. I mean, just from the phones that I've thrown out, I'm, I'm definitely yeah. at worse than two out of three. <laughs> well, I don't think the average consumer 
gets a new phone every year like we do. I, no, think, I think it's every two years, which is still pretty frequent. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, if, if there's there's a market for reselling old devices, there could there's people who still use older devices that just can't afford the latest and greatest and buy used ones from people who who can and. So I wonder, how many I, like original iPhone up to iPhone four would you see in the wild? Well, I can tell you that my parents still use the iPhone four. So <laughs> okay, all right, um, your sample size confirms everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm curious what's still in use. Like what qualifies as still in use? Because um, there's definitely some products that that can't be measured. Like an iPod Classic that has no connection to the internet, how are people going to know if that's still being used or not? Mm, Unless they just yeah. took a, a like a sample population size and sent a survey out to them. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, two out of three devices ever sold is incredible. Considering you know Apple started in '76, that means they've sold so many products in the last I don't know ten years that. It eclipses the you know hundreds of thousands of computers they'd sold in the decades prior that are no longer being used. Yeah, and I think to a like even more compact view of that, the devices sold in the last three years eclipses everything for the previous you know since the start of the company. Yeah, that's and true. that's how you Just... end up with a number like two out of three. Yeah, I guess I guess with the number of devices they've released, like. I've got an iPhone and I've got iPads and I've got an Apple Watch and so I probably own and use as many Apple devices now as like the total that I'd own prior. If you don't count yeah. all the old old computers I collect now. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> so I mean I've got the old Apple. You still Apple boot II. them up? Oh yeah. Um Oh really. So I kinda think it's it's fun because I'm a, a software engineer by day yeah. to kind of get these older systems and try to program on them as well. Oh, so wow. I'm, wor- I'm working on an Apple II game right at the moment, actually. <laughs> so and well, actually, what? I I just ordered yesterday an Altair 8800. Um, uh, I'm not sure if, if you're familiar with those or not. The Altair is is kind of responsible for the start of Microsoft. Uh, oh, these machines, yeah, from yeah, like early Bill 70s. Gates and yeah, yeah, Bill Gates and Paul Allen like dropped out of college to write the original version of Basic for this computer and that's what started microsoft wow. so but the only way to like program it is with the toggle switches on the front entering <laughs> like one byte at a time so i'm pretty excited to play around with that too do you have to get these working or you try and buy them in working condition so so in the case of the altair i actually ordered a clone um, mm, because yeah. because a new altair like not a new altair this clone was seven hundred dollars but mm-hmm. an original one it goes for a few thousand now and mm-hmm. i don't want to try to maintain one of a computer that that uh fragile and that valuable yeah um i have i have repaired a lot of a lot of the computers in my collection like i have some of the original macintoshes and some apple twos and things like that that i've been able to repair uh, mm-hmm. those are closer to a modern computer that i am kind of comfortable working on them and Altair is old enough that I would probably feel a little lost. Did you get the audio cassette interface with it? I did. <laughs> nice. Yeah, so I'll be able to load stuff off of cassette tape if I want to. I wanted to ask, what programming language are you programming the Apple II game with? Um, so I started with just trying to write it all in uh, AppleSoft Basic. The The problem is running Basic on on any computer of that age it really slows down the processing speed and also limits the amount of memory you have access to. Mm-hmm. So I'm trying to rework the whole thing in assembly now instead so I can kind of supersede the whole basic process, fit more information in the game, and make it run a lot more efficiently. That sounds pretty intense. <laughs> I mean, it's it's nothing like modern programming at all. So it's a kind of an interesting puzzle, I guess. But So these older... Um... 8800s you're mm-hmm. paying almost um for a real one a thousand dollars per megahertz 
Yeah. <laughs> <Take your notes. laughs> and you're not and you're really not guaranteed you're gonna receive a working a working machine. Oh. <laughs> so um and honestly at this point, especially those computers, there's so few of them and they're so instrumental in the like modern computer revolution that I would say they deserve to be in a museum more than they deserve to sit on one of my shelves. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. So but yeah. That's what I've been working on. Pretty excited about that. Very cool. Yeah, I'll look forward to... Maybe you could put some um, videos up then on your YouTube channel if you get, like, a game going or yeah. when you get the 8800. Yeah, I'll definitely... Uh, I still intend to, at some point, get that YouTube channel focused on older technology and just posting stuff about my collection. So, And it makes perfect sense to have that I in front of the name when you're doing vintage computers. <laughs> well, I, like I said, I tried to, tried to drop that whole thing and just call the channel Tech Today, but... Apparently, you can still only find it under the iTechnology, like, original name. Yeah, yeah, definitely can. But, oh well. So. All right. Sounds like a show. I guess so. Hopefully, the uh, other guys will be able to show up next time so you don't have to try to carry the whole thing. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, it's good to know that we don't need four or even three people to, like, to talk for an hour about Apple. Well, well, next time we'll uh, we'll just all not show up and we'll see if you can carry the show for an hour, James. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. That, that, that's never going to work. <laughs> yeah, that'd be that'd be really challenging. I don't know if you pretend yeah, to have a conversation are, with yourself. Would you actually pretend to have a conversation or would you just go on a, a monologue? Or is that the same thing? I guess they'd be pretty similar. Um, yeah, I don't know. I couldn't do it. There's no way I could talk on my own for an hour without having someone interact with. <laughs> Yeah, I think I've only listened to maybe one podcast where there's a single host like that, where it isn't just like a script-based reading thing as well. Or actually, yeah. it could be. He could just be a really good script reader. But it's a podcast called Lexicon Valley. It's um, about English language. And oh, he often okay. doesn't have any guests on the show. And he just talks for an hour about you know, interesting things about English. Huh. Worth a listen if you're interested in language. Yeah, I'll check it out. Lexicon Valley. Okay. Yeah. Um, if you go back to the, like the first show, it did have two hosts, but the recent shows are down to one host. Hmm. Kind of makes me think of, like, I listened to some NPR podcasts. Actually, I don't know what it'd be called in Australia. NPR is our national public radio. Um, well, yeah. it's, it's called the same thing here, but oh, okay. it's not our it's... national public radio. <laughs> okay. I, I didn't even know if like it was in Australia or, or not. But uh, Oh, yeah. NPR is worldwide. Oh, okay. That's news to me. As in, uh, I wouldn't say... <laughs> uh, I assume that it's like a radio station yeah. that, that's constantly broadcasting. Uh, you couldn't tune into NPR as a radio station, but the brand sure. NPR and their association with tons of podcasts is definitely widely known. Okay. I listened to uh, one of their podcasts called Hidden Brain. I don't know if you've heard of that, but they... Uh, man, it's kind of like a little bit of everything, but they talk about just human interest kind of stories so to i've definitely seen that in the top charts but i haven't listened to any of it yet yeah it's it's pretty good uh they talk about let's try to think about recently something like things about marriage equality and women's rights and uh there was one all about like drug use and well i think there's one towards the end of the last year about like what it's like to go to vegas <laughs> so i don't know it's pretty they're pretty interesting that's mostly one one host who has guests on that he interviews mm, so yeah but did you listen to invisibilia uh no i haven't heard of that one okay that's yeah another npr podcast okay man i already have trouble keeping up with the podcasts i do listen to <laughs> <laughs> that's true i'm constantly going um like going through my list and adding and deleting trying to get yeah uh, the most interesting ones yeah do you listen to any like um i don't know what you'd call them like tim ferris joe rogan style podcasts uh do you know do you know that guys i don't know who those who those people even are <laughs> oh, okay <laughs> googling joe rogan podcasts it's some of the top interview yeah. style podcasts oh interesting the joe rogan experience so i don't i don't listen to a lot of interviews like i listen to hello internet um mm-hmm. on and off yep, me too um i listen to harmontown i don't know if you've ever tuned into that tried it wasn't a fan really um actually dan Harmon also has a second podcast that i try to tune into a, a, occasionally called whiting wongs 
and it's him and another uh him and uh another writer off of rick and morty i believe and they talk about like it, it's again kind of like like issues going on in the country and and race relations and things like that it's a great name for a podcast yeah yeah exactly because <laughs> <laughs> uh, because uh sh- she's asian and he's white so they call it whiting wongs yeah i wonder how but, easy uh, it is to get that playing on the home pod like <laughs> oh i don't know just a, a, a i've never tried to do that yeah because our um, show is impossible there's no way to get the home pod to play it oh the R yeah. apple show yeah, because there's probably no way to ever get Siri to actually interpret a forward slash as the actual forward slash <laughs> character. I've tried the Rapple show, the Apple show, <laughs> the R forward slash, the R slash. <laughs> oh, that's too bad. Maybe we should rename the whole show just for the HomePod. Mm. <laughs> yeah, we'll just wait for Siri to get better. Oh, yeah, maybe someday. Did you see um, there was some of the original like creators of Siri came out like in the last week and like was trying to wash their hands the whole Siri thing and say, we're not responsible for the for the quality Siri is now. Yeah, that was so bad, wasn't it? Just trying yeah, to shovel blame off them onto someone else. Yeah, there's like a few, like a lo- all the big tech publications picked it up. Like these original creators behind Siri, like were trying to, I don't know, throw Apple under the bus. So like everyone, there was infighting about what Siri should be and if she should be just like a quirky, quick assistant or actually useful and... It's not our fault. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. And from the sound of the article, even up until recent days, the actual teams behind Siri are not well integrated. They're like different teams doing different parts of Siri. Um, you know, you, you never know how old some of this news is. Did you actually read the, the information article? The information article. The, sorry, that's, I didn't say that well at all. There's an article on the website called The Information. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which no, I think I triggered this I think triggered this fight or these these, these tweets I, ha- I hadn't I hadn't seen that I never heard of the information even <laughs> no I hadn't either, either until now but it's quite a good article because it goes into basically from series inception up until what sounded like pretty recent days and the complete lack of organisation and leadership in the teams that are backing it or creating it huh I mean, Siri, yeah, Siri definitely had a lead over all the other digital assistants, and it really got squandered by her just not getting any better since she was now, what, 2011? Mm. And then all these other, like, Alexa and Google Assistant just... Oh, and Alexa. Alexa heard me. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> You've got to call it Echo, all right? <laughs> What's that? You've got to call it Echo. Yeah, that's right. I just need to rename it. But... Yeah, these other virtual assistants came onto the scene and really surpassed Siri and Apple. I seem to be really, really uh, lethargic with adding any significant improvements like actually usable web searches. Yeah, well, I'd highly re- recommend reading this article then because it sheds okay. some light on um, what could be the problem. I mean, uh, yeah, if you the- go, actually, if you, it was on um, the Daring Fireball, if, sorry, on daringfireball.net. Okay. Um, if you just look through this week's articles, because the information's behind a paywall, but he's got a link in his article which will let you access it without paying. Oh, okay. Just by giving an email address. Oh, okay. Yep. Information on what went wrong with Siri. I see here. Mm, that sounds right. Okay. Yeah, I'll have to check this out. I mean, that doesn't surprise me at all that there's a bunch of infighting in Apple behind Siri, it seems like that's the story behind all their products. Is like there's different teams fighting about how it should work or whose product is better. Um, yeah, and you just have to hope that the person who comes out on top is, you know, strongly opinionated enough in the right direction. Yeah. That you're going to get like an iPhone with a touch screen and not a click wheel. <laughs> I feel like that's really left over from like Steve Jobs culture because this dates back all the way to like the original Macintosh in the early 80s when Steve Jobs would, like, pin the Apple II team against their Macintosh team to compete, or who's better, whose product's going to win, and I feel like that's too yeah, and part of Apple's culture, almost, is all this infighting. Uh, a lot of that left when Steve Jobs died, and then um, Scott Forstall left. He also seemed to generate quite a bit of that like, hyper-opinionated um, work. Yeah, I've heard Scott Forstall was really similar to 
Steve Jobs and kind of being a jerk and strongly opinionated. Um, but yeah, he left and he was kind of ousted because of the Apple Maps debacle. I feel like he was almost a scapegoat for that. Like, we don't like you, and also there's this issue going on, so we're going to use this as an excuse to fire you. <laughs> yeah, you definitely get the sense that not a lot of people liked working with him. Yeah, and things, I mean, changed pretty drastically after he left, too. His iOS 7, yeah, it was a result of all that being handed over to Johnny Ive. So, Yeah, you, you could almost say that design has taken priority over a lot of things to the detriment of the products and the software. Yeah, I definitely feel like there's more like bugs in full releases of Apple software than there used to be. Cause they're focusing too much on making it pretty, I guess, and not perfecting it. I don't know. Hmm. Yeah. We could speculate all day, but we should probably wrap it up. <laughs> yeah. Kind of going long here for just the two of us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Yeah. All right. That's good. I'm James VDM on Reddit and Twitter. And I'm Jelly Woot on Reddit and Twitter. And we also have a extremely popular Patreon page, which I realized last fortnight that I didn't actually give the link to it in the show, which was a little silly of me. So it's patreon.com slash the R Apple show with no slashes in the R Apple show. Right. Okay. Yep. <laughs> um, so yeah, we appreciate any support and we will keep the show free of ads. And until next fortnight, hey? All right. Sounds good. All right. Nice talking with you. Yeah, you too.